As always, our recordings of our virtual meetups will be available on YouTube about a week after the meetup, and we'll post a message on meetup when the recording is ready. Okay, I am very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Alexander Smith. Alexander Smith is a fifth year graduate student working in the lab of Victor Zavala. Prior to pursuing his PhD, he worked for five years as a senior engineer in both manufacturing and R&D at Eli Lilly and Company. Alex's research focuses on the development of topological and geometrical data analysis methods for applications in various engineering and scientific domains. So Alex is comfortable um, if you just wanna ask questions throughout the talk or um, ask in the chat, um, you can do it there and I'll interrupt um, and speak your question um, or you're very welcome to unmute yourselves um, and ask yourself. Um, so take it away, Alex. All right, great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen here. Oh, wait. Um, I need to share my entire screen. There we go. Okay. I hope everybody can see the full screen now. Okay. Yeah, so uh, as before, I'm Alex Smith. Um, I'm in the group of Victor Zavala at UW Madison in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. Um, and today I'm going to be focusing on something known as the Euler characteristic, which we're really going to use as a general topological descriptor uh, for complex data. And so the way that I kind of want to frame this talk is by looking at, you know, the reasons why we're leveraging these methods uh, through various chemical engineering applications, right? So the first application that we're going to be looking into are these ideas of liquid crystal sensors. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar, liquid crystals essentially uh, represent a state of matter that has characteristics of both liquids and solids, right? So this might be something that flows like a liquid, but has long range ordering like a solid. These are used in TVs and things like that. But what's also nice about liquid crystals is that we can make uh, very accurate sensors with them. And so what we're looking at here is sort of a visualization of how these sensors work. And so what we're doing is we're taking a thin film of liquid crystal and depositing it on a reactive surface. And so basically at the beginning of the simulation, you can see the liquid crystals are sort of homeotropically bound to that surface. So they're kind of standing on their heads and they're interacting with these binding sites on the surface. Now what's nice is that we can tune these binding sites to be reactive to particular analytes, right? So we want to detect SO2, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, et cetera. So what happens is that gaseous analyte that we're seeing in yellow, when we expose the sensor to it, will diffuse through that liquid crystal and actually bind to those surface sites. Now when that happens, it interrupts the interactions between the liquid crystal and the surface and they start to reorient, right? And when that happens, we get these really interesting optical responses in the sensor. So here are actual images of experimental setups that we have for these sensors. Right, and so on the left-hand side, right, is where the sensors start out, right? So these are where the liquid crystals are homeotropically bound to the surface. And what we're seeing is we're looking at this through a cross-polarized microscope. And so light is polarized, passes through these sensors, and then it hits a second orthogonal polarizer. And so when it hits that second polarizer, if that light hasn't been refracted or bent in any way, then we're just gonna see a black box, right? Now, when we expose this sensor to a gaseous analyte, right, we start to see changes in that system. These liquid crystals reorient and they actually bend and refract that light around that polarizer and we start to see patterns form. So here what we're seeing is the beginning over time and then eventually we get to the end point where we get these really interesting sort of patterns and textures that start to show up in our system. Now, you know, these sensors are really great at detecting the presence of an analyte, but we also want to understand the relative concentration of that analyte, right? So here we could have a low concentration where it's non-toxic versus here where maybe somebody needs treatment after exposure, right? And so our goal here is to quantify the topological differences between these endpoints of the sensor responses. So, uh, you know, again, here what we're looking at, right, is the data set that we're going to be looking at. So on the left-hand side, we have a set of sensors that have been exposed to a low, maybe non-toxic analyte concentration. 
And on the right, a set of sensors that have been exposed to a high analyte concentration. And so this is just a subset. There's a much larger data set here. I'm just showing you a few samples from this data set. But again, our goal, right, is to quantify the differences between these sense responses using topology. So the first question is, right, how do we measure the topology of an image, right? And so what we can do is we can actually take our images, right, and basically represent them as manifolds, right? And on that manifold, we can have some function that represents, in this case, the pixel intensity, right? So here's one way to visualize it, and then here's more of the manifold structure that we're going to see, right? So we still have our x and y spatial dimensions, but now we have a third dimension, right, that sort of corresponds to this function mapping, right? And, but if we look at this image, right, from a topological perspective, there isn't anything really interesting going on, right? Because it's just a single connected component and there's no like holes or anything in it, right? So the question is, how do we take this and get meaningful topological information out of it? So one of the ways that we can do that is through something known as a filtration, right? And so on the left-hand side, I'm kind of illustrating uh, what's happening during this filtration, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take that function that's on our manifold and we're just going to threshold it. Right, so we can imagine this sort of plane on the bottom here, basically going from the bottom of this image all the way to the top, right? And as we pass that plane up through our, through our system here, we're going to slice off more and more of that manifold and everything that's below that threshold is going to get in, added into the shape that we're measuring. And so we're doing that at each point in this threshold. And what we're going to do is measure the changes in the topology of that corresponding shape as we perform that filtration, right? So the way that we're going to measure or quantify topology in this case is through something known as the Euler characteristic. And what we're doing here, right? The Euler characteristic is simply, you know, simply put is the number of connected components minus the number of holes in the image or the manifold. And so here, what I'm showing you is what we're constructing from that system, which is called the Euler characteristic curve. So at each point in this filtration at each of these threshold levels, we're going to compute the topology of that corresponding image. And so here we have our initial filtration piece, right? So if I threshold this system at point two, you can see the threshold goes up a little bit. And basically what we're finding, right, are these formation of connected components in our system. And so this starts to drive our Euler characteristic more positive. Now, the connection here, right, is that these connected components are really capturing the local MAC or MOC minima of our process, right? So we're sort of picking up the local minima of this function on this manifold. As we keep passing through, right, we pick up more and more of these local minima, we end up with more and more connected components and that drives our Euler characteristic value more positive. Now, as we keep going through this filtration, right, we're gonna pass something else that's interesting, which are saddle points in our system. Right, so we pass these saddle points and what happens is these individual connected components start to join together. Right, and eventually we get to the point where we're at like a single connected component, but now we see that there are many holes forming in this system. And what's interesting is that these holes represent the presence of local maxima in our function. Right, so we go from connected components very positive to a single connected component with many holes which drives us negative. And eventually we get to the point where we have a single connected component, right? We're back to our original image, which is sort of, sort of topologically trivial. It's just a single connected component. But the important takeaway here, right, is that I've taken this complex two-dimensional image and I've converted it into this simple one-dimensional function, right? And we can really think of this Euler characteristic basically as a vector of values that describe this image. So sort of like a feature vector for this image. So now that we've gone through that process, right, we can apply that to all of the images in our database and we can start to see differences in these two groups, right? So here, what we're looking at is the average or the characteristic for our low concentration samples versus our high concentration samples. And what we see right away is that there are definite differences in these two groups, right? We can see the low concentration system looks very different. And Again, our goal, right, is to separate these sensor responses via this Euler characteristic curve, right? And so what we found, right, was that we're able to actually classify this data set with 95% accuracy using a simple linear classifier 
And previously to get this same level of accuracy, we required complex convolutional neural networks, right? So the Euler characteristic is able to simplify the data representation, but also simplify the models needed to get optimal performance. Okay, and so one of the things I want to show is that, you know, this is not some trivial result, right? We are actually doing something that's meaningful here. And so what I want to compare is the Euler characteristic curve method to another very common method, which is the 2D Fourier transform of images, right? And so what we're doing here on the left-hand side is basically taking our curves, which we treat as vectors, right? Stacking them into a big matrix, performing PCA. On the right-hand side, we're doing the same thing with the 2D Fourier transform, stacking it into a big vector, matrix, PCA. And what we find on the left-hand side, right, is that when we look at the Euler characteristic curves, we're seeing that there's a great separation in the data just using the first principal component, really, for the system. And when we look at the Fourier transform, right, the data is very much overlapped, right? So what this foreshadows is that when we try to do the same sort of linear classification on the right-hand side, um, we end up with a very poor result. So the Euler characteristic really is capturing information that something like the Fourier transform is missing. And so here I wanted to show a quick example of this. And all the examples that I'm going to show are all contained in this GitHub. So uh, some of them have examples, some don't, but all of the code for all of these examples is found in here. Um, and so I just wanted to quickly go through and show you kind of how this code works and basically point out a, the main package that we're using in this, which is called Goody. And so Goody is basically, you know, we're given an image, it can compute the topology for us, right? And so here what I'm using, you know, I'm importing Goody, just a few analysis tools, nothing really spectacular. Um, just doing some formatting. And here what I'm doing in this block is basically creating a function that passes through our image, filters it, right, through our filtration. And then we're using Goody to sort of compute the topology at each point in that filtration, right? And so here I've defined that function. Here I'm defining the filtration in this case. And for this example, right, I'm not allowed to share the actual LC data. So what I did was I generated uh, another data set that's basically from random fields. Uh, but those are known to well match these LC sensor responses, right? So here I'm creating a method to create those data sets. We go through the data set, right? Create the EC, or the characteristic curve, the Fourier transform, et cetera. Here's some images of the two different environments we've generated, right? So we have environment one and environment two. And if we look at them, right, there are some differences, but it would be really difficult to really tell these two apart. So again, we go through, we perform our Euler characteristic transform on these systems, get our two curves, or our average curves. We see that there's a difference. And here I'm just going to perform PCA. And we see that these two environments are basically perfectly separable in this case. And then if we go down here, right, we look at the 2D Fourier transform in the system and we find that there's really no separation. So, um, you know, that's just a single example of that analysis. Now, what's really nice about topology in general, right, is that it generalizes to higher dimensions, right? I can do the same type of analysis with a higher dimensional object without worrying about really changing how the mathematics works in this case, right? So previously, right, we'd had our LC images with our manifold representation. And now I want to go into a system where we're looking at molecular simulations, and now we're looking at things in three dimensions, right? And so here we're looking at our molecular simulations for the conversion of biomass basically into usable products, right? So polymers uh, and things like that. And what's interesting or a hypothesis behind these studies is that, you know, here we have our reactant, which we're trying to transform. And basically if you dissolve that in a particular co-solvent water mixture, it can actually change the efficiency of that reaction, right? And so one of the hypotheses behind that is that the water structure in our simulations is actually driving that change, right? So the water structure around the molecule will actually get shifted around and will change how efficient that reaction is. And so the way we want to study that is basically by looking at these molecular simulations, which are pretty much just a bunch of molecules bouncing around and sort of chemically interacting with each other. And we're going to create a water density manifold, which is basically looking at the entire simulation space and then averaging the positions of water over time in that space. 
So here again, we have our water density manifold, right? And again, what we want to do is sort of quantify the topology of the system. And so, you know, previously what we looked at was sort of a two-dimensional manifold with a function on it. So now what we're looking at is a three-dimensional manifold with a function associated with it. So previously I could illustrate, you know, it as a 2D plane passing through the system. So this would have to be a 3D plane passing through a four-dimensional system. And I have no idea how to draw that. If you have ideas, please let me know. Um, but basically what we're looking at here, right, is that same exact thing, right? We're going to do that filtration where we set some threshold and then we increase that threshold. And while I can't illustrate the exact filtration to you, I can kind of show you the level sets that we were looking at previously. Right, so just like we were doing with the previous simulation or the previous uh, data set. And so here we're seeing, right, as we pass through, we're getting these low density areas, which kind of show up as different connected components in our system. As we keep increasing that threshold, we start to form holes or handles as they might be called in this case, right? So that's where we're getting this sort of negative value here. And then eventually we get to the point where we get a third feature. Right? And these didn't exist in the two-dimensional systems, but can exist in three-dimensional systems. And these are what are called voids. Right? And so basically it's like a hole or an air pocket right, that's been entrapped in that system. So it's completely encapsulated inside that surface of that manifold. And so that's where we start to see this second peak is because of the presence of voids in that system. But again, right, what we're doing here is we're, we're taking this really complex three-dimensional manifold with a function, and basically summarizing it as this simple vector of values. And so our goal, right, is to take this information and understand these simulations, right? And so another interesting piece about these simulations and about topology in general, right, is that it's invariant to a lot of different types of deformations of the data. So in this case, right, if we look at these density fields, which we've subsampled from the same simulation, right, so here we have different parts of the simulation. If we look at these density fields and you looked at them and you tried to say, okay, it's hard to tell that these are all, you know, the, from the same simulation, right? They all look very different. But if we measure their topology through the Euler characteristic, right? We can see that the Euler characteristic for each one of these is almost identical, right? So while this density field is changing over time, the topology of it remains very stable. And so that's important, especially if we're going to subsample simulations for training a particular model, right? We don't want to get a different answer at one point in the simulation versus another point from the same simulation. Now, okay, so here what we've done, right, is we've taken these water density fields and we've converted them all into these Euler characteristic curves, right? And so chemists and chemical engineers are very interested in saying, okay, can I go from this simulation and this topology and predict an experimentally verified reactivity, right? So that I can, instead of going into the lab and creating these systems, can I just do it via simulation, right? And so what we're doing here is we have for each one of our other characteristic curves, right? For each one of our simulations, we actually have experimental values for the reactivity increase, right? Or decrease, if it may be, right? And so basically what we're doing is we're training a linear model using these Euler characteristic curves and predicting this actual physical experimental reactivity that's been verified in the lab, right? So we train this model and then we use this linear regression model to go in and say, okay, can we predict for a completely different set of chemistries, completely different set of co-solvents, can we predict that experimentally verified reactivity using this simple linear model, right? And what we found, right, is that we are able to do that quite well. It's not perfect, but it's, it's very, very close. Right. And again, what we're seeing, right, is we're using this simple linear model. We're using this simple topological representation of the data. And previously to get this same level of accuracy, we had to train complex three-dimensional convolutional neural networks to get this same answer. Right. So again, this is an example where representing the data via topology allows us to kind of cut down on a lot of the nonsense that's in the data and use simpler models to get as good of results as with 3D CNNs, things like that. Um, okay, so now I wanna go into a different example um, where here we're looking at, you know, uh, not images or, or voxels, but here we're looking at our multivariate time series, right? 
So here's what we call the Tennessee Eastman data set. And those of you who are unfamiliar, the Tennessee Eastman data set is basically a very high fidelity simulation of a complex chemical process, right? And what people have done with this simulation data set is, you know, they've, they've run it and they introduce different types of faults into the system. So what they could do is they could go in and crank down the temperature of something, uh, remove, remove a feed stream, et cetera, right? And the goal with this data set is really to use the process data that we get from the system to detect changes in process behavior. And so here's an example of some of the data that we get from the system, right? So here, for example, is a simulation of the process in the presence of fault one, fault seven, and fault 15, right? And so what we're seeing are these really complex multivariate time series that we're really trying to understand. And if you look at them in the raw format, right, it would be impossible to tell uh, which fault belongs with which time series, right? And so we need a better way of representing this data that's, uh, you know, amenable to our computations, right? And one of the things that, you know, I've noticed in my study and with some of my collaborations is that there's actually a really deep connection between process systems and this multivariate time series analysis and an area of neuroscience, right? And what's interesting is that neuroscience has taken this different approach where they actually represent this multivariate time series as topological objects. So just to give a little background on some of the problems that I've worked on, right? So here is what we're looking at, right? This fMRI data, where basically what we're doing is we're taking a patient, putting them into an fMRI machine and having them read a book, watch a short film, solve a math problem, et cetera. And basically what we can monitor in their brain at different locations are things like blood flow, temperature, oxygen content, et cetera, right? And basically after we process all this data, what we end up with is an interesting multivariate time series, very similar to what we're getting out of our process data. And so in this problem that we're addressing, right, here what we're looking at are sets of patients with developed brains, and then a set of patients with underdeveloped brains. And each of these patients has been put in the machine and basically told to watch a short film, and we're going to watch how their brains react and then try to distinguish between these two groups, right? And so one of the ways that we can do that very efficiently, right, is by representing this data as a topological object. And the way that we're going to do that is by taking our fMRI data, which is again a multivariate time series, constructing something like a correlation matrix, right? So it could be correlation, covariance, et cetera. But basically what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the absolute value of correlation between each of the variables in this time series. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat this correlation matrix basically as an edge weighted graph, right? So basically at each point in our brain, we're going to consider that a given variable. And then we're going to draw an edge between each area of our brain. And what we're going to do is we're going to weight that edge with the absolute value of correlation between those two variables, right? So we go from this multivariate time series to this sort of edge weighted graph. Now, what's nice about edge weighted graphs is that they're amenable to exactly the same thing we were doing previously, right? Which is filtrations, right? So instead of looking at a function on a manifold, right? We're going to look at this function on our edges of our graph. And so what we're going to do is we're going to threshold this graph, right? And so here I'm going to start at a very low threshold. So I would start off with basically, if I went above this, a bunch of nodes, right? There are no edges. I'm going to slowly increase that threshold. And as I do so, I'm going to add in more and more of my edges until at the very end, I end up back with my completely dense graph. And what's really nice is that for graphs, we can compute the Euler characteristics simply as the number of vertices minus the number of edges, right? So at each point in this filtration, we can compute that. So again, here's an illustration of our filtration, right? And then on the right, we have our Euler characteristic curves. Right? And so here I'm looking at the absolute value of correlation as my filtration. And then we're just measuring the topology of that graph as we pass through the filtration. And what immediately sort of jumps out right, is that there's a definite difference between the topology of graphs with developed brains versus underdeveloped brains. So we notice here immediately that the correlation matrix topology is really able to quantify these differences and the presence of these brain abnormalities. Now, what we're going to do, right, is apply that same sort of strategy 
to our process systems data, right? So here we have our process system and now we can sort of, sort of think of this as a brain, right? It's got all these different measurements, but it'll be measuring things like temperature, flow, uh, level, uh, you know, concentration, et cetera, right? And we get out of that our multivariate time series. And again, we wanna use the sensor data to detect faults in this process system. So again, we're going to do exactly what we did before, right? Take our multivariate time series, construct our correlation matrix, and from that, construct our correlation network, right? So now we have our topological object that we can measure. And so here on the left-hand side, right, we see our filtration, where again, we're taking that filtration, we're going up, up, up. We add more and more edges to our system until we get back to our fully dense graph, right? And what we can see right through the Euler characteristic is that we are actually able to separate out when the system is behaving correctly versus when the system is experiencing faults. So again, this correlation matrix topology quantifies these process faults, right? So here, I wanna show you a quick example of, of how this works uh, through our Python here, through our GitHub. And this one is actually very, very simple. Right, so I'm not really introducing anything here. I mean, these are all just simple packages. Um, and here is really the, the bones of the code, right? All I've really done to construct my Euler characteristic, right, is input my matrix, which I'm calling A, and some threshold here, right? And all I'm doing is converting that into basically a binary matrix, which becomes essentially an adjacency matrix, right? And from that, I can compute my edges, vertices, and then my Euler characteristic. Right? So it's literally like three or four lines of code and I can get that out, right? And then I can combine this with my filtration. And, okay, sorry. So here we're loading in the data, loading in the data. There's the correlation matrices that we're seeing an example. And then here I can just, you know, compute my Euler characteristic for these systems. And again, we get back uh, that original result, right? So a very, very simple way to sort of handle some of these more complex data sets. Now, um, one of the things that we notice, right, or a few of the things that we notice about this, right, is that process monitoring the EC curve is nice because it's fast computationally, right, so it should be very scalable. Uh, we're not required to fit any sort of model or anything like that other than computing like correlation or covariance. It's also nice because it provides a global descriptor for this process, right? But we notice some things, right? So when we look at this data set, right, we see the faults are kind of grouped into two groups. But when we look into the individual groups, we're not seeing much difference, right? So it's difficult to distinguish between the actual faults themselves. And so one of the ways that we want to address that issue is through something known as Ramanian geometry. And this is more recent work that we've done. So when I talk about Ramanian geometry, I'm specifically interested in the space of symmetric positive definite matrices, right? So all of the matrices that we're concerned with are going to be symmetric and they're also going to be positive definite in this case, right? And so here we have our example matrices and on the left, I'm sort of illustrating what those matrices might look like on this manifold, right? So this SPD manifold, as I call it, is a conic manifold and basically, any matrix that is going to be SPD of this same size is going to sit somewhere on this cone, right? And what's interesting is that these matrices all form this particular Ramanian manifold, right? So it's some manifold that's embedded in some ambient Euclidean space. Now, the question is, why is that important? Why do I care about this, right? And the reason we care about it, right, is because when we do a lot of data science and machine learning, one of the inherent assumptions that we can make, right, is that our data lies in some linear vector space, right? So things like Euclidean distances are absolutely true when we discuss the relationships between these components, right? So here what we're looking at, so let's say here I make that assumption, I look at my matrices and I say, okay, I'm just going to assume they're in Euclidean space. Let me compute the relationship for the distance via the Frobenius norm between these points, right? And what I find via the Euclidean distance is that X1 and X3 is actually, you know, the distance between these two is actually greater than the distance between X1 and X2, right? If you do this, do this with a Frobenius norm. But what's important to note, right, is that Euclidean distances do not reflect the underlying manifold geometry, right? We're sort of ignoring that. 
now let's look at it and let's consider the geometry of the data, right? And here what I can compute, because I have this manifold, I'm aware of it, I can compute something known as a geodesic, right? And this geodesic is basically going to be a distance that's constrained to this manifold itself, right? So if I were to go any point on this, uh, this path between x1 and x2, it's guaranteed to be an SPD, meta, or an SPD matrix, right? And so now if I look at these geodesic distances, right, I get a different story, right? Now I see x1 and x3 are actually closer than x1 and x2. So I'm getting sort of the opposite answer than I would if I just assumed Euclidean space, right? And so, you know, we can do this via this simple Ramanian metric here. And what's important, right, is that, you know, not only do we want to consider the geometry of the system, but we also want to be able to implement it in our data science tasks, right? Like classification, regression, uh, dimensionality reduction, et cetera, right? So how can we take this manifold geometry and start to integrate it? into those tasks. So the first step in that really is identifying something known as the for shame mean of our data, right? So here we have, you know, just an example set of data points, right? And we can imagine that this is some subset of that Ramanian manifold, right? That SPD manifold. And what we wanna do is we wanna identify the centroid on that space. So basically the point on that manifold that minimizes the geodesic distance to all other points on that manifold, right, with respect to our data. The way we can solve that is through this simple optimization framework here, this problem. And here I've computed the Frechet mean for the Tennessee Eastman data set, right? And we can see that X bar is basically an SPD manifold or an SPD matrix, which is guaranteed to be, and it's of the exact same size as the other matrices, right? And so the reason we wanna compute this central point is because we wanna find a point where we can construct a tangent space and basically unfold this manifold onto this linear vector space, right? So here we have is our, our centroid, right? And we're constructing a tangent space at that centroid. So any curve or anything that's going to pass through this point, we can construct, uh, you know, we can take the derivative and find where that tangent vector points and then create a space from those tangent vectors. Now, what we're going to do is basically this tangent space is a vector space, it's a linear space, and so we can take this really curvy manifold and basically squish it onto this, man onto this tangent space and make it completely flat, right? So we can think of this as similar to uh, looking at a globe, right, of the Earth. If I wanna measure distance on the globe, it's going to be very difficult for me to do it with a flat ruler, right? But what I can do is I can take that map, that globe, and project it onto a flat plane. And now I can start to measure things like distances, areas, angles, all sorts of stuff. And the reason we identify the Frechet sure mean, right, is because that minimizes the geometric distortion of that projection, right? So like if you look at a map of the earth that's been projected, right, most of the time, things that are very near the equator have almost no geometric distortion. But if we look farther out, like the North and South Pole, right, we can see that they're very inflated, right? So there's a lot of distortion there. So picking this point allows us to analyze our data in this linear space, with minimal distortion to the data. And so again, here are points that sit on that manifold, right? So here's an example of one. And here I've projected it to the tangent space, right? So you can see it's the same type of matrix, just the values have been shifted. And so we're going to do that for each point in our data set. And now the other important point, right, is that now that we're on this tangent space, we're actually in a vector space, right? So now we can perform things like PCA, dimensionality reduction, et cetera, without worrying about the curvature of that manifold. Sorry, my dog is barking a little bit. Um, okay, so here what we can see, right, is basically I'm comparing the principal component analysis with raw data where we haven't done this tangent space transform, right? So it's basically assuming that the data kind of sits in this Euclidean space versus accounting for the geometry of that manifold on the left-hand side. And so what we see, right, is that when we look at our no-fault simulations on the right-hand side, they're basically completely overlapped with our faulty simulations, which are shown in these different grayscale values. If we look at the left-hand side, where we've just projected the data onto that tangent space, we can see there's a great separation of the no-fault simulations from the faulty ones. But we also notice 
right, is that some of these faulty simulations are actually clustered into groups that we're not seeing on the right-hand side. So this suggests that we might be able to classify these systems with a simple classifier and separate out the actual faults in this process. So here we have, right, again, is our raw data, right? And we've, we're doing this classification task, right? So what we've done is we're, we're trying to train a model that classifies, you know, whether a given fault is occurring in the system. And so we're looking on the right-hand side is what's called a confusion matrix, right? So basically with a confusion matrix, an ideal one, you would see all ones in the diagram, right? Because what that means is that every time I predict something to be experiencing fault five, it's actually experiencing fault five. And that would be true, right? Any value on the off diagonal, right, is going to represent a misclassification. And in particular, in this classification task, right, we see that we're predicting, in this case, false negatives, right? So here we're saying there's no fault when, in fact, many times there is a fault present, right? And we can kind of see that where we have this overlap. So basically, the accuracy is very low when we use the raw data. Now, what we've done, right, all we've done is taken our data and projected it onto this tangent space. And we're going to do that exact same thing, right? So accounting for the geometry of this manifold. And what we see, right, is on the right-hand side, if you look on the diagonal, we're seeing almost perfect classification of the data, right? And when we look at faults three, four, nine, and 15, right, we see poor classification, but those faults are all classified within each other, right? We're not seeing them being classified in other spaces. Right, so this suggests that maybe these matrices don't, you know, aren't accounting for enough of that information and maybe injecting more information to this would allow us to better separate these classes. Um, okay, and then so I'll go through a quick example of this here. Um, so here we have, you know, uh, this one's a little bit more in depth um, and I won't go through it in too much detail, but again, it is available. So you can feel free to look through it and see how it goes. Um, basically importing a few packages, a lot of sklearn stuff just for the classification, et cetera, some formatting things. Um, here I'm just importing the data, computing the covariance matrices. Uh, here I've defined some matrix operations that we'll need for this algorithm. The biggest piece really here is computing the Frechet mean, right? So basically what we've done is we've set up an algorithm that basically computes a gradient descent step on the manifold itself, right? So we can solve this problem uh, on this manifold and this problem is geodesically convex. So we can use gradient descent and we're pretty much guaranteed to get an answer, right? And so we can see here, right? If we look at our loss function versus our step number, we're getting to within a very high tolerance, um, you know, within seven steps. So it's a very easy problem to solve. Once we've identified that for Shay mean, right? We can take our data and here all I'm doing is just projecting it onto that manifold or onto the tangent space. And then here I'm taking the tangent space data, performing dimensionality reduction, and we get our answer, right? And so here, of course, is the classification results. And we can see again that issue with three, four, nine, and 15 uh, not being as well classified. Uh, okay. And so basically in summary, right? Uh, what we kind of talked about here is this idea of topological and geometrical data analysis. Right, so the goal of this right is really to take our data and represent it um, in some topological geometric way, right? So we can look at things like manifolds, point clouds, graphs, and then integrate the topology and geometry of those systems into different tasks, right? So like unsupervised, supervised learning, etc. And then here are some of the application areas where we've been able to apply this: uh, things like collective behavior, space-time dynamics, uh, process networks, some of the things that you've seen um, in this talk. And so with that, I'd really like to acknowledge um, all my collaborators, uh, my experimental collaborators in this case, UW Madison and Cornell, uh, my advisor, Victor Zval, of course, and then references where um, all of this stuff that we've talked about should be available or is available. And then also another topic called uh, persistence homology, which is a, maybe a more advanced area of topology, applied topology uh, that might be of interest to everybody. And then of course we have our code here uh, which is just through GitHub and Zavalab slash ML. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Um, and I see there are some chats that I just saw. Uh, so I'm not sure if there are any questions, but I'd be happy to take any more questions.
Great. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I have a couple of questions. So yeah. the organizer, maybe I get to go first and people can feel free to fill the chat with questions. Um, so, so I have two. One, I kind of missed, how did you go from something in chemistry to SPDs? Um, oh, right, right. So um, SPD matrices, is that what you're asking? Yeah, like I don't yeah, know okay, okay. as much. There's something chemistry and then you got a matrix. <laughs> okay, okay, yes, yes. So I should be more clear about that. Okay, so so what I'm doing here is I'm basically using these, so these correlation matrices and things that we derive from this process data, mm -hmm. that's basically what I'm using here. Okay. So I've, I've computed those covariance or correlation matrices, you know, in this case, covariance matrices, and I'm using that data to try and distinguish these different types of faults that occur uh, in this process system because the Euler characteristic was able to say, you know, our process is behaving correctly or it's incorrectly, but it wasn't able to distinguish between those different types of faults. And so here what we're saying is, okay, we can leverage the geometry of these matrices now to sort of get a more, uh, a clearer answer and a better answer than we were with just the straight up Euler characteristic curve. Cool. Uh, and my second question, I recognize it's a little bit ill-defined, um, but you're saying that the Euler char characteristic is stable, or maybe I would say invariant with respect right. to the water density simulation. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, is that like something you know from chemistry or did you need the math to figure that out? Um, yeah, so, so I use uh, stability here uh, very loosely. Uh, we don't have actual proofs for this, uh, okay. but basically, yeah, what we're doing here is, is we're looking at these observations and you know, when we look at these density fields, they're very different. So there are a lot of deformations that are occurring from like a geometric perspective or something like that spatially. Um, but we measure them to topologically, they're very similar. And so one of the things that we think is happening here is that these systems are actually behaving like random fields. And so the structure of random fields is very well defined from a topological perspective. And so that's why I think we're seeing uh, this stability. So I don't have a proof for it, but I think we're kind of getting to that point where we can say something like that more strongly. Very cool. Uh, I'll just read some of the comments. Kevin McDonald said, I thought this was incredibly interesting, gave me lots to look more into. Thanks for sharing this. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Kevin. And if you have any uh, questions or anything, you know, feel free to email me or reach out to me. Um, I think my website is on the, on the link uh, and I'll put my, my email in the chat as well. So feel free to, to reach out. Yeah, I definitely will. I don't have any use cases for this now, but I definitely wish I did. It seems very, very cool. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks again. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Eric Klusman, feel free to speak. Hi. Um, the uh, time series plots that you show, uh, they look very dense. Is that because uh, the time series is really moving like that, or are these are plots of multiple time series? Uh, yeah, so these are so in each one of these plots, I have 52 time series, right? One for each time during our process. Yeah, I see. I see. And the correlation or covariance is uh, between these 52. Yes, that's absolutely right. Okay, now yeah. I understand. I hadn't seen uh, topology applied to time series before. This is very interesting to me. Thanks for presenting. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, if you have any ideas down the road, feel free to reach out. Uh, you know, I'd be more than happy to help out. Terrific. Thanks, Dr. Andrew. Yeah. We have a question from the chat. Ted Kai asks, thinking about the oil, Euler characteristic that you calculated in your two and 3D examples, does the fact that your data is discrete pixels or voxels instead of true continuous data affect the EC calculation? Uh, yeah, so that's a very insightful question. Um, yeah, so here what we're looking at is something called uh, basically converting these objects into simplicial complexes, right? In this case, they'd be cubical complexes. And so, yeah, so because we're not as refined, right, it could impact the topology of these systems slightly, right? It, as if I had a, a more continuous field or I even, you know, split these voxels into even smaller voxels and took uh, an approach from there. Um, so yeah, it can affect it. And the way you discretize it can affect it. But what's interesting, right, is that, you know, if we look at these topological features and their structure, right, we can see that 
you know, because we're looking at this from a topological perspective rather than a geometric perspective, we can still have these big topological features that we can capture and it might be unaffected by how discrete we're looking at, right? Because all we're concerned about with topology is really this idea of connectivity, right? Rather than actual physical size. So, um, so that can be one of the benefits of looking at it through this lens. But um, if you go to uh, the Goody website, right? Um, and, and you look at some of the papers that, that we have listed at the end here, uh, that can give you a greater explanation of how that works and how it can or cannot, how it might or might not affect uh, the result of the topology. Yeah, it's a very good question. There was previously a couple of DMs I got just asking for um, links if you were comfortable sharing your slides um, and also for the GitHub link. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd be more than happy to share the slides. And then uh, the GitHub link is all the way over here. Yeah, so I can put that, um, see if I can put it in the, in the chat or, well, I guess I can't copy it, but you'll have it with the slides and you'll have links to all the problems in, and every single one of these uh, problems that we've addressed also has an example in the GitHub. So you can go ahead and, and mess around and do whatever you want with all these examples. Great. I'll wait a little bit to see if any more questions come through. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, we're also getting thank yous in the chat. Um, this is a really great and clear talk for such a mathematical topic. I really appreciate it personally. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. thank you. That's a huge yeah. compliment. So I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, as a reminder, uh, this is a monthly meetup. We're generally uh, the fourth Thursday of the month. Um, so keep an eye out on our meetup page for our next meetup. Good to see right. everyone. Yeah, thank you all.